So masking refers to the practice of concealing or suppressing aspects of our identity or aspects of our neurodivergent traits from the neurodivergent lens. It's doing this in order to fit in with norms, with neuronormativity or the mm -hmm. norms of workplace or the norms of society. And as we all know, workplace environments center around neurotypical social skills, communication mm -hmm. abilities. Mm -hmm. And so often neurodivergent people perceive whether or not it is safe or unsafe to unmask and reveal or disclose our identities, our traits, our strengths, our challenges, our diagnoses, if we choose. And I think there's advantages and disadvantages to masking. Absolutely. Well, hey, friend, and welcome back to the podcast. I couldn't possibly wrap up the current self-care series without addressing the topic of neurodivergence, masking, and mental health. One of my favorite people to discuss these topics with is Pasha Marlowe. If you're not familiar with her yet, Pasha is a fellow therapist, coach, podcaster, speaker, and passionate DEI advocate. We are going to talk about the risks and benefits of masking, understanding that there are places where this protective mechanism is actually in our best interest to hold on to, and the difficulties we can have with unpacking it and letting it go, even when we are in safe spaces. I'm excited to share our conversation with you, so let's get right to it. As two neurodivergent women, you and I have many things in common, and one of the hottest topics that we have been discussing is a term that is associated with you and in the process of being trademarked, and that is neuro belonging. And the first time I saw it, Pasha, I thought, I have to know everything about neuro belonging. So where shall we begin? I love that. Yes, we, of course, have all heard of belonging, but I felt like it wasn't deep enough. It wasn't complete enough. It certainly didn't speak to me as a multiply neurodivergent person. So neuro belonging is not about fitting in or masking. Fitting in, this is a Brene Brown quote, by the way, mm. fitting in is about assessing a situation and becoming who you need to be to be accepted. Belonging, on the other hand, does not require us to change who we are. It requires us to be who we are. That was Brene Brown. And so I took this idea of when we don't betray ourselves, when we choose our truth, standing in our own truth and power, we can belong anywhere. Because often when we hear about belonging, we hear about showing up without the fear of judgment or people accepting us, which is beautiful, but they don't always. And mm. so I take it to that next level, the inside job, the journey to neuro belonging is showing up even when other people are judging me or criticizing me or rejecting me because I'm staying true to myself, to my values, to my integrity and my character. Does that make sense? It does. And I have so many questions and you know me and that is very typical of me because I'm super, super curious. So it sounds like what you're saying is that the sense of belonging is internal and doesn't actually require anything of the other person or persons. Have I got that part right? That's how I interpret the word I coined neuro belonging, but that's not typically how belonging is talked about. Belonging right. is often talked about, right? In the DEI B, um, and I'll include A, uh, Jamie Shields, who's a brilliant content creator uh, in the disability community, he wrote, equality is everyone getting a pair of shoes. Diversity is everyone wearing a different type of shoe. Equity is everyone getting a pair of shoes that fits them. Accessibility mm. is having shoes or alternatives that feel comfortable. Inclusion is feeling respected or valued, whether you're wearing shoes or not. Belonging is showing up with or without shoes and without the fear of judgment. And I love that, but mm. there is 
often judgment and I'll be honest, a fear of judgment sometimes. So I have to stay, and you and I've talked about this, how, mm-hmm. how I experience this in personal and professional arenas. I know I'm going to be judged and I kind of fear it. And yet I have to stay very true to my own course, to my own character and integrity. And then I can belong anywhere, even if it's lonely. (laughs) Mm, There's so much to this. It's one of the things I love most about you, Pasha, is that you're such a deep thinker and you don't just stand on your own thoughts. You do research, you connect with other people, you explore the differences in your perspective versus theirs. and, And you're always looking to take understanding to a deeper level. And I really, Mm -hmm. really resonate with that. So everything that you say, I'm like, oh, but I have like 50 questions for that. But with this is not a 50 hour (laughs) podcast, friends. So just, I know, I know I would love that so much. So we can belong in your, in your framework, we can neuro belong wherever Mm -hmm. we are because we are belonging to ourselves and we are not betraying ourselves. So whether we are accepted rejected, whether we're getting microaggressions that maybe someone less sensitive might not even notice or recognize Mm -hmm. or respond to. Like I'm belonging to myself and I am belonging to myself no matter where I am. I think this is so important, Pasha, because a lot of people will say, stop reading people's minds. Stop assuming that people are thinking certain thoughts about you. Stop assuming that people are seeking to reject you, exclude you, judge Mm -hmm. you. That's not happening. I just don't find that messaging to be at all accurate because the reality is not all of them are, but Mm -hmm. some of them are. And to teach people Oh, they're not thinking that. Don't yes. think that. It sort of defies our own intuition and instincts, yes. which we need to rely on a lot, I think. Yes. This reminds me of the conversation I have with people, specifically ADHDers, around RSD, rejection sensitivity dysphoria, which is this emotional and physical pain in response to actual or perceived rejection. So Mm -hmm. that or perceived really bugs me, as does the dysphoria aspect. But nonetheless, it's based in actual rejections. There was actual trauma and actual rejections, which brought us to the point of people pleasing and and burning out and worrying that we're going to be rejected or sensing that we're going to be rejected. So we might be perceiving it, but it's still based in actual rejection. So I don't, I agree with you. I don't want to dismiss people of their actual lived experience. And I want to give people agency to speak their truth and trust their own intuition. And if I feel like I'm being judged or rejected, I'm going to trust that intuition and I'm going to keep myself safe by potentially masking in certain situations. So you anticipated my next question like a (laughs) rock star. I was helping you with the transition. Oh, yes. Well, you know, because we both have ADHD, among other things, we both know that transitions are some of the more difficult points for us to navigate. And they tend to be where we either go blank or go off on a tangent. So I welcome and invite your assistance. So you're absolutely right. And it's something you and I have talked about many times and know very well, which is when we do not feel safe to be ourselves completely, to neuro belong. Mm -hmm. Masking is one of the options that we have. We can talk about other options, but masking is probably the the thing that most people do when leaving or opting out is really not the appropriate thing in work settings. I mean, you can't just walk out of every meeting where you don't feel welcomed and where you might be being criticized or judged. So for those who are less familiar with this term and all that it encompasses, let's talk about what masking is and isn't before we go Mm -hmm. into the rest of it. So masking refers to the practice of concealing or suppressing aspects of our identity or aspects of our neurodivergent traits from the neurodivergent lens. It's doing this in order to fit in with norms, with neuronormativity or the Mm -hmm. norms of workplace to the norms of society. And as we all know, workplace environments center around neurotypical social skills, communication Mm -hmm. abilities. Mm -hmm. And so often neurodivergent people perceive 
whether or not it is safe or unsafe to unmask and reveal or disclose our identities, our traits, our strengths, our challenges, our diagnoses, if we choose. And I think there's advantages and disadvantages to masking. Absolutely. I just think about all the different ways that I have masked in the Mm -hmm. past. And I think early on, you know, high school, early college, and I'll, I'll tell you a story. One specific incident that's coming to mind is I'm in a college class. It's in a big lecture hall. There were probably a few hundred people there. It was a UCLA. And it was a fascinating lecture that I was following 100%, but because of my hyperactive ADHD brain, while attending to the lecture, taking notes on the lecture, I was also on my little desktop highlighting an article for another class and balancing my checkbook in a little corner (laughs) of the desk. And this was so normal for me. I I no longer multitask because I know too much about neuroscience now that I'm like, okay, Mm. that, that probably wasn't the best thing. But what led to masking is that for me, I was just being me. I was just doing me. I was just doing what I need to do. And all of a sudden I just had this feeling of tension Mm. and I thought, what's going on? And I I sort of glance around me and I literally saw no less than three people, one on either side and actually one behind me just glaring at me. And I thought, Mm. what's happened? Am I talking to myself, which I sometimes did, or did I (laughs) fart and not remember like what's going on? (laughs) And one of them just leaned over and says, will you just stop? Oh, it's distracting them. And I thought, uh, stop what? Mm -hmm. And she just said, just all of this. Mm -hmm. I felt so shamed, Mm -hmm. so judged, so rejected, and also Mm -hmm. confused because I was Mm -hmm. just being me. I obviously had a lot to learn at 19 years old about how my ADHD-ness was being perceived by others. But I'll tell you what, I started sewing a mask that very minute and yanking it up. Yeah. Yeah. I find myself doing that, which is discouraging, more often than I thought I would depending on where I am, of course. Mm. Uh, Sometimes I'll mask my queerness, which is sometimes verbal Mm -hmm. and sometimes quite obvious, depending on how many rainbows I'm wearing, in certain (laughs) states or countries. Mm. Sometimes Mm. I'll mask my gender nonconformity and my pronouns she, they, with people who I know will offer lots of feedback and negativity and microaggressions because I've seen it. So Mm. sometimes I'll mask my ADHD autistic uh, movements when I'm presenting in front, uh, like when I'm doing a keynote for a corporation, even though I'm talking Mm. about neurodiversity and neurodivergence, sometimes I'll notice that it's not received as easily when Mm. I'm super fidgety. And so I see. I know my. I know myself to do this. I was interviewed once for a movie called Freedom to Love, and the interviewer said, "Can you just make eye contact with me?" And I said, "It's interesting because we're talking about ADHD and autism, and I'm talking about ableism, and I'm talking about how it's often challenging to make eye contact. But here's why for me, for me, and this resonated with a lot of people. It's not because I can't or don't want to. For me." When I make eye contact with somebody more in live than in person, Mm. but even still sometimes digitally, I am very intuitive and empathetic, by the way, against stereotyping of autism again. Mm. I feel people's pain. If I were to look into your eyes for more than a few seconds, I will cry because I will feel and absorb your pain, your traumas. Mm. And so when she was interviewing me, I wasn't looking at her. I was talking about vulnerable things. She was sharing vulnerable things. I was kind of looking to her forehead. Mm. And so she gave me that criticism and I offered that as an explanation. And then I cried because I was trying to not cry, but then I cried. And so many people made comments after that when they watched the movie saying, oh, that resonates. It's not that we can't look somebody in the eye. It's just so much stimulation, Mm. overstimulation, lots of information coming in when we have that intimate eye contact. That's not for everybody, but for me. 
No, that makes so much sense. And I, I remember getting feedback in the past when I would be communicating with a superior. And because I'm a verbal processor and the way my mind works, as sometimes if I haven't already thought through how I want to respond to a conversation maybe I wasn't anticipating, I'm literally thinking how I want to respond while I'm responding. And when I yeah. do that, I usually am looking up and to the right. So yes. I'm, it's almost like I'm, I'm typing out the words or I'm writing out the words that I'm saying on a notepad or on a, on a yeah. laptop. And then the person will say, can we have some eye contact here? Because uh-huh. in uh, neurotypical norms, that's read mm-hmm. as sort of deceptive or w- like withholding or you're not being in, you're not revealing your true thoughts or all mm-hmm. of your thoughts. And it's like, it's just so interesting. But what's really fascinating and unfortunate is that even in a setting where you are invited as an expert speaker on these mm-hmm. very topics, mm-hmm. just because mm-hmm. that doesn't make it safe. And I will say this now, and I've said it a hundred times, and I'll probably say it a hundred thousand more before I stop talking on the topic, is that I trust my intuition mm-hmm. above all else. But that took some digging because of how many years I have learned to mask. I used to be so proud of what I called at that time passing for normal or hiding in plain sight. Mm -hmm. I was, Mm -hmm. I thought that was a massive flex. They don't even know how different I am. And, and, you know, let's, let's unpack the risks and benefits because truthfully in settings where we aren't really safe, it is a skill and it may be absolutely necessary. Yeah, to get a job, to keep a job, for example. Sometimes if we are in a, let's say, a relationship with somebody who's being aggressive or violent, sometimes we mask to emotionally regulate other people, to keep other mm. people comfortable. I mean, how many times have we all done that at a family reunion? All the time, Mm-mm. right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and we're like, this is not the time I'm going to pull out these, you know, to all these traits. Because we know, because we read the room. And there's disadvantages to it because it's exhausting. It takes a physical and emotional toll to mask, to hide, to conceal anything or suppress any of our tendencies or identities or truths. Um, It also feels, I think, quite misaligned and lonely, but both are painful. Like it's painful to be judged and rejected and unsafe. And it's terribly painful to not be respected or seen and known. And so I feel like I'm always making these decisions, like is Mm. today the day or is this the moment where the pain of, um, there's that quote by a poem by Anise Nin, and then the day came when the risk to remain tight in a bud was more painful than the risk it took to blossom. And I, ret- I refer to that poem a lot in my mind, <laughs> but I think it's beautiful and it makes sense to me. We have to make these decisions. And you and I have talked about this as we get older, <laughs> mm-hmm, <laughs> like f- mm-hmm. 50 and up, like all yep. that's off a lot of times. I, there's a more unapologetic unmasking that happens, which I love. And it's in my own environment that I've created and the work that I've created for myself, for the most part, I am unapologetically unmasking. But I've heard from too many people who, for example, have a parent, not uh, a parent disabilities, a parent neurodivergence. They don't have the privilege to hide it or mask it. Somebody who's schizophrenic, somebody with Tourette, somebody uh, with Down syndrome. They don't have the privilege or ability to mask it all the time. So it is a parent and can be less safe. A black autistic person is unsafe in most of the world. Uh, And so I never say death unmasked, no matter what, you know, we have to, Mm -hmm. we have to be able to understand when it keeps us safe and when it doesn't. But I think the goal, if I were to zoom out to a more beautiful world (laughs) where things weren't pathologized and stigmatized and neurodiversity was more accepted and affirmed, then I would hope that we would be able to be less masked Mm. over time. I hope I live long enough Mm -hmm. to see more of that in the world Mm. because the the reality is that there are all kinds of differences between people. There always have been. This is true of the animal kingdom as well. And 
rejecting mm-hmm. what we don't understand. Yes. It hurts everybody. It doesn't just hurt the neurodivergent person. It hurts the neurotypical person as well. Yes. And I, I like to remind people that are judging those of us that are different. Where do you think most innovation comes from? <laughs> think about it, it, folks. <laughs> the innovation, uh, new inventions, new ideas, disruptive thinking, mm-hmm. breakthroughs in science, mm-hmm. in the marketplace, you know, in in the social world and politics, it doesn't come from the status quo. It doesn't come from conforming to the norm. It doesn't come Mm -mm. from maintaining standards that have been around for a hundred years while the world has been changing at an ever increasing rate. They Mm -hmm. need us, even if they don't, even if they don't understand us. And I think, you know, that could be a point of pride. I love what you said, Pasha, about really kind of unpacking the privilege of being able to mask successfully Mm -hmm. because you're Mm -hmm. absolutely right. You know, many people don't realize there's actually three different subtypes of ADHD. And I don't think there's any surprise that the folks who are severely hyperactive and impulsive have the hardest time masking because they have the greatest difficulty what I call curbing their enthusiasm, restraining their impulses. They think Mm -hmm. it, they do it, or they don't even think that they just do it and they get Mm -hmm. in trouble for it, which is why so many people who are in our prison system, many of them have unidentified ADHD, the hyperactive impulsive subtype. Meanwhile, if you happen to be female, female identifying, Mm -hmm. racist female, and you have the inattentive distractible subtype, Mm -hmm. you're just quietly underachieving and being underestimated Mm -hmm. your whole life and you're not causing anybody any trouble. So you can probably mask much more effectively, but make Mm -hmm. no mistake, it's both an advantage and a disadvantage because you are, I love your term that you're basically betraying your essential self. How can we have satisfying relationships, like truly Mm -hmm. satisfying, nurturing, mutually beneficial relationships if we can't be who we actually are. Yeah. And I think our relationships, friendships, partnerships, our circles get smaller as we get older, right? I become far more discerning as to who I'm going to uh, unmask with or use my spoons up with, right? And I feel like a few people in our corner, on our team, who understand us, accept us, we don't have to ask for accommodations or say our support and access needs. We don't have to disclose all of our diagnoses because we have conversations based in trust and respect and agency and autonomy. And we, we understand each other. We know that if we're going to go out to dinner, my friend and I, that we, we know we're not going to pick a loud uh, room. I know that one of my friends uh, is has difficulty hearing out of one side of her ear. I'm not going to put us near the kitchen. She knows that I get distracted by a lot of lights or traffic or parking difficulties. And so she's going to find a place that has like a big parking lot, <laughs> nowhere near the c- center of the city. And so we make these accommodations for each other without really any discussion or shame or stigma anymore. And I feel like if we have just a few of those people in our lives, be it friendships or partners, it it really helps. And if, if you don't have that yet, connecting with other neurodivergent people is a good start. But I will say, I don't resonate and connect with all ADHDers or all autistic people or all queer people. Like we still have to really figure out who we want to be in community with. I'm in community with a lot of neurotypical people who I think are fantastic people. Mm. And, but that's because they're curious learners. That's because they're willing to listen, willing to say, I don't know, or tell me more. That's interesting. I love that. Those are my people. That's who I want to be in community with. These are such good points. And I don't think people talk about them enough. Hey there, it's Diane with a brief interruption. I hope you've been enjoying the self-care series as much as I enjoyed recording these interviews and bringing them to you. I'm hearing from so many female solopreneurs that they completely forgot to take their neurodivergence and self-care needs into account when they started their business and now they're working way too hard and struggling to balance passion and purpose with profit. 
If that's you, I'd love to help. I work with a limited number of one-on-one clients so that we can go deep into building your business and you as the business owner at the same time. If that sounds good, let's have a conversation and see if I'm the right person for the right reason and if it's the right time. You can book a free consultation with me through the link in the show notes. Okay, let's get right back to the interview. I think one of the reasons why, a couple of reasons why I'm kind of coming late to that part of the party is because my communication skills are my greatest strength. And so my the way I've used communication before I even realized I was neurodivergent is like pretty wired in there and developed. So learning how to use more inclusive language, it was a blind spot I didn't even know I had. And because I was successfully masked for so much of my life, it's something that I'm, you know, kind of going into and wanting to be sensitive about because Mm -hmm. language is very, very powerful. And we can hurt people inadvertently. Yeah. I think words matter. They can empower us or disempower us. And I get some criticism, for instance, on LinkedIn, when I talk about words, such as the very common misconception that neurodiverse and neurodivergent can be talked about interchangeably. Not true. Uh, There are no neurodiverse individuals. There are neurodivergent individuals. And people are like, well, who cares? Like, why are you getting hung up on this? And Mm. because it matters because of what it means, what it represents, neurodivergent diverges from neuronormativity. We're all neurodiverse as humans, all neurodiverse. Mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. if we, so it it just matters. I think words hold a lot of meaning and power. And then I take it a little bit further and I talk about the neurodiversity paradigm versus the pathology paradigm. So we've been, and especially as mental health professionals, you and I, Mm -hmm. we were Mm -hmm. trained in the pathology paradigm through the DSM, the Bible for all therapists, where everything is labeled disorder or dysphoria or deficiency. And rather, if we say difference, that Mm. already, like even if we just drop the disorder, even if we just drop the disorder, instead of saying autism spectrum disorder, autism, bipolar disorder, just say bipolar, post-traumatic stress disorder, post-traumatic stress, like legitimate responses to human experiences. Mm. I feel like that would be a really good start, different rather than disordered. And there's other terms that like when people say, what are your symptoms or what are your conditions? That's more pathologizing Mm. than saying traits or experiences. You know, if we talk about the symptoms of ADHD, that kind of implies that it can be treated or should be treated, that there's a problem. And for some people, they do want treatment, but that's Mm -hmm. not true for everybody. And it's not for us to decide. Like who decided what was ordered and disordered? Well, capitalism and colonialism, white supremacy and patriarchy. (laughs) But anyhow, then we talk about things like low functioning people, Mm. right? Functioning according to who? Low, high, as if there's a value judgment in it. So rather than saying low functioning people, I say we have a low functioning society that Mm. doesn't yet, doesn't yet accommodate for all people, for Mm. all minds. And so it's subtle changes, but not really. I mean, you know, it's, it's really coming into our mindset and our, our own personal paradigms and ableism, internalized ableism about the right way, the ideal way who should be fixed, who should be treated, who should be medicated, who should be quieted, right? This is, again, hopefully we'll see it in our lifetime, but I'm seeing a trend. Less people are saying mental illness. They're saying mental health challenges. That's a good start, right? Yes, Um, yes. So it's, it's happening, but there's a lot of resistance because if we lean into the diagnoses and or the disordered aspect of Mm -hmm. it, we get support. We get accommodations. We might get medicine. We might get the access support or support that we need to survive. And so the worry is if we take disorder out of the conversation, people won't get the help and the accommodations they need. There's also a controversy around (laughs) putting certain mental health challenges under the neurodivergent umbrella because people are like, no, 
mental health is pathologized. Mental health struggles are definitely pathologized. Let's say something like schizophrenia. Mm. So we don't want to put something like ADHD or autism under that same umbrella because then people will pathologize that as well. Well, they already do, first of all. And I would argue we're trying to depathologize and destigmatize all differences, right? Is that making sense? It makes 100% sense. And as a matter of fact, one of the things that I decided to do when I put my therapy license on inactive status, I'm still a licensed therapist, Mm -hmm. is one of the reasons, one of the many reasons why I decided to do that was because I wanted to voluntarily relinquish my legal right to diagnose people. Yes. So I use the same, some of the same language you do, Pasha. I prefer to say, uh, when were you identified with ADHD or when did you identify yourself Mm -hmm. as ADHD? Mm -hmm. I'm Mm -hmm. also very keen to use accurate language. For many years, people would say, oh, I don't have ADHD, I have ADD. Okay, I don't want to correct you, but I'm going to because- (laughs) The term is ADHD, and there are three different subtypes. So if you don't identify with the H, chances are you would identify with the traits of the inattentive distractible subtype. Mm -hmm. Would you like to know what they are? But Mm -hmm. I think we are in a time right now, we're recording this in 2024, and we are at a time, I think, in our Western culture where Mm -hmm. identity is front and center in so many conversations. This is certainly true in the LGBTQIA community. This is true in ultra other cultural, religious communities. But I think how we think of ourself, mm-hmm. how we identify ourselves, what terms, what labels, what names we use to say, this is me, I think is extremely important. And symptoms are things that have been decided upon by other people who don't know you. Exactly. And they've been classified as Mm -hmm. pathology. I mean, ADHD, autism, these are not mental illnesses. These are considered to be mental disorders. You and I are talking about them as mental differences, which have Mm -hmm. strengths and struggles. But it's, it's sticky. It's a tricky, sticky business. Because on the one hand, like, does it matter if you Mm -hmm. are officially diagnosed? Can you identify? Well, I think it matters if you feel you need an official diagnosis to be able to claim that part of your identity with confidence. If you feel you need that, by all means. But to me, the the best reason for getting officially diagnosed with anything is because there may be medication or other forms of treatment that you want access to through your health insurance, because this is how the medical model works. We are Mm -hmm. talking about the the medical model because outside of medication and treatment, how we identify ourselves, whether we think of these things as symptoms or traits, whether it's a diagnosis or, or an identification, none of that really matters unless you need access to something that involves a third party and the medical model. Yeah, and it definitely needs to be stated that, and I definitely honor lived experience and, and self-discovery, self-diagnoses, mainly because it's completely inaccessible, financially inaccessible. There's mm. wait lists of years often, and often the people who are diagnosing are coming at it with their own implicit biases and their mm. own lens of potentially the pathology paradigm. And so a lot of people are being misdiagnosed. They'll spend the $3,000, wait the three years, they'll get there, and they'll leave with anxiety and depression, not ADHD diagnoses, uh, right? Or, you know, it's still not a perfect science in any way. And neurodivergent is not a diagnosis, right? Neurodivergent is the umbrella that includes a lot of things that are diagnosed. And I also wanted, before I forget, neuro does not mean brain. Neuro is nervous system, So we talk about diversity of minds more than diversity of brains, which allows us to then bring in the very real aspect of a lot of neurodivergence that is not up in our brain or in our head at all. It's our whole body. The way I move through the world is also part of my expression of my neurodivergences, right? Or my multiple neurodivergences. And so Mm. I just want to, a lot of people say neuro means brain and it's not true. Mm. This is a really good point, and it, it it acknowledges and incorporates and includes the fact that emotional dysregulation is 
part of the lived experience of many neurodivergent people and autistic people, people with ADHD, rejection sensitive dysphoria you mentioned earlier. That is related to the emotional dysregulation that many people experience. But you also don't have to be neurodivergent to experience that because Mm -hmm. many queer people who are not neurodivergent experience rejection sensitivity, highly sensitive people, empaths, highly creative people, gifted people. I'm curious because I know if I don't ask you this right this very second, Pasha, I'll probably forget. (laughs) I mean, we'll we'll have another conversation later, but I'm like, do you personally think that individuals who are identified as gifted are part of the neurodivergent universe. I think anyone that diverges from society's idea of normal, in big quotes, can identify as neurodivergent. I think one of the aspects of giftedness is often that kind of 2E, twice exceptional Mm -hmm, dynamic, mm -hmm. where they can be very uh, successful in one area, that whole spiky profile, and then Mm -hmm. disabled in another. And so I think sometimes when parents of gifted children ask for help, they get kind of poo-pooed on. Like, why does your kid need help? Your kid is brilliant. Your kid's a genius. Your kid's a a musical master. Yeah. And they struggle with life skills or they struggle with social skills or they struggle with writing or reading or math or who knows what. And so, yes. Belonging. (laughs) They struggle with belonging. In fact, there's there's a book that I often mention by Eric Meisel called why smart people hurt. Mm. And because mm. when when kids grow up being different, in whatever way they are, they yeah. get the message loud and clear starting from a very early age, you're not okay right. because you're different. Even if that means you have 50 higher IQ points than the kids you're in school with. And the teachers are really rough on gifted kids too, because sometimes those kids are able to think faster than the teacher does. And the teacher Mm -hmm. feels intimidated by this 10-year-old in the front row who's constantly raising their hands. Oh, yes. Yes. I (laughs) had a child who had that experience, just picked up on math uh, in a, a way that nobody could understand. So he was asked to sit in the back of the room and just do Mm -hmm. busy work or draw because he finished in 30 seconds what it took some other kids or the teacher hours to do. And then, you know, the teacher would get frustrated. They wouldn't have worksheets that would even accommodate his mathematical intelligence. And so fortunately, uh, this is one of my success stories. And I think a good lesson for parents, my kiddo, who I never formally diagnosed, but I believe autistic, drew thousands of hours of drawing cars, because that's all Mm. he cared about is cars. Mm -hmm. He drew them in the back of the classrooms. He drew them after school, before school. He didn't socialize as much. He wasn't the, you know, kid who was uh, popular. People put him in this in the friendship club because they thought that he couldn't create, you know, keep friendships. He drew, he drew, he drew. And then finally, one day, he signed up for a drawing contest through Ford to design a futuristic Mustang. And he drew it and he sent it away. I did not know this. And I get a call from like the Ford executive saying, your child who lives in a barn, by the way, in New Hampshire and only sees pickup trucks and Subarus has won the international upcoming car designer of the year award. And he's getting a scholarship to college and Ford will hire him out of school to design cars. And that is what he's doing living in Detroit. He draws cars just like he did when he was a kid. He makes a ton of money doing it. He loves it and he's flourishing. Now that's an unusual success story, but had I said, you're brilliant at math, you should do something mathematical. You should, I mean, like so much came easy to him academically. What he loves is drawing cars. What he focuses on and breathes and, and you know, that's where he gets lit up. And so mm. I, just, I just feel like, I feel like that's a good message to give parents, you know, who have our own expectations, our own fears, our own internalized ableism, our own stigma and, you know, beliefs about what the world is and who we want our children to be and, and are they going to be okay? Are they going to survive the real world, you know? He didn't know how to do a lot of things I would consider as adulting. He figured it Mm, out. mm, 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 And maybe not independently, maybe codependently, maybe with help. And I think that's fine. You know, we're all like aiming for our children to be 
financially independent, live on their own, be independent. Like, that's okay if they're not. That's okay if we need to live with people. That's okay if we need help and support needs, right? So we don't, that's not the goal. Who said that was the goal? To be independent in all ways. I'm not independent in all the ways. No way. <laughs> no, but I'm you- not doing my own taxes ever. Yes. Ever. <laughs> yeah, that's the that's the most strenuous thing I do each year. And I've done it, I don't know how many times, and I still hate it and struggle with it and spend far too much time doing it. But to your credit, you understood that your son needed to be supported to be who he is and not converted. And I think it, it's a sad fact that, you know, I mean, most of these conditions are genetic. And before I was officially diagnosed with ADHD by a child psychiatrist as a grown ass <laughs> woman, uh, all, I passed it on to all three of my kids from two different marriages. So I'm the common denominator. And one of them still hasn't been officially identified. The other two have each. I have three. Have, we have three different subtypes in this family unit. And if I have, I prefer not to say I have regrets because that's a colossal waste of time and energy. But had I known yeah. that in my lifetime that it would be possible for me mm. to not only be open about who and how I am, but to mm-hmm. be able to use that openness to connect with people who accept me more readily, more completely with a deeper level of understanding than I have ever experienced. Had I known that, and had I known this was genetic, and had I known that I passed it on to all three of my kids, I think I would have done a better job of encouraging them to figure out who they are and how they are and double down on that. Because in the early years of my parenting journey, I just did what I saw people around me doing, which is try to get my kids to fit in. Two of my kids are highly creative and they're all Mm -hmm. very original thinkers. Now as adults, that's all worked out. None of them has had to spend extensive time on the therapist couch, but (laughs) it's been a journey for all of us to learn to accept ourselves. And we've all kind of done it separately, but together. I see a lot of this happening in families, not as much as I'd like, where sometimes grandma gets identified uh, as Mm -hmm. being on the spectrum or ADHD or both, Mm -hmm. and now is having conversations, some of the most meaningful conversations Mm. with their kids and grandkids of Mm -hmm. their entire life. So real healing can come from this within families. And I, it's never too late. Oh, I was just going to say that when I work as a therapist or coach in whichever capacity talking to my clients and they say, oh my goodness, like my kids are grown. Had I known, had I, had I known about myself, there's this grieving and, and shame and regret. And first of all, we did the best we could with what we knew, but also it is never too late to say, I have learned something new. I'm learning and I'm learning, unlearning. And I'd love to have a conversation with you about how I language things when you were younger, uh, if I used words like lazy or distractible or unfocused, if if I gave you uh, friction or, or judgment around your resume, which by the way, mm. is like 20 different jobs yes. and l- seemingly scattered. I love talking to ADHDers about the resume because mm. of course, an outside view looks like you went from, you know, selling knives to children's theater to therapy. Like how did that work? But there's a common thread mm-hmm. in all of our adventures and journeys. And the the path is not straight. It's wiggly, which makes it better and more dynamic. We know the common thread. Maybe it's service to others. Maybe it's love yes. of animals. Maybe it's human interaction. Whatever the common thread is, you will see that in your resume, even mm. the ADHD years with three months here, six months there, one year. And that takes a lot of shame out of the experience of applying to jobs, thinking I have nothing to show for all of my work or my intelligence or my gifts or my strengths, nothing on paper. It would seem that way. It feels that way. And my parents might reiterate that to me. And then I'm not waiting for the day that they come out with this, but I'm going to do this for my own children. (laughs) Yeah. Because, you know, we can't, we can't control other people, but we could do that for ourselves. We could be 85 and still have a conversation with our child about something that we have realized and discovered and apologize for it. 
and work towards, you know, repair at any time. And we can continue. You and I use some of the same languaging around this learning and unlearning. Yeah. As long as this brain is still functioning, as long as I can still (laughs) rub a couple of gray cells together, I choose to be on the path of continuous personal evolution. And it always requires learning and unlearning and humility. Oh, yes. Humility saying, actually, I don't know as much about this as I thought I did, or I don't know anything about this because it wasn't even on my radar. Will you share with me what you know? Yeah, yeah. I I love that. That's a sign of a good leader, you know, Mm. to lean into that. I don't know in humility. And the best conversations I've had recently are people who are like, this is such an awkward question, Pasha, but I feel safe asking you, um, why, why do you say you're queer if you are married to a man? How do you, why do you use she, they? That's confusing. What does that Mm. even mean? Or, you know, why do you call yourself autistic if you're able to blank, blank, blank. And I love these questions. I love these questions because they're willing to be curious and learn. And then it opens up a conversation that I think when we feel safe unmasking, like then we have, I think the responsibility as neurodivergent, weird, queer people to then liberate others, to be their full out neurodivergent, queer or weird self, right? In whatever form that takes, like we can liberate others by, by, standing in our truth. And that is harder when we're younger, I feel like. So I love this about aging. <laughs> I do <laughs> too. I, I absolutely, yeah, there's some parts I'm, that, that are not so fun. But this is the part that one of the parts I love the most is that we, you and I, although more me, <laughs> am at that legacy stage of life. Hmm. And what I want to be known for Mm. is helping people who are different Mm. embrace that fully, practice radical self-acceptance of themselves and others, and like Mm. spread the word that just because you're different doesn't mean you're less than. What makes you different makes you special. Mm. And you you can own that with your whole heart. Yes, it takes practice. Yes, it takes courage. Yes, it takes seeking safety but I think it's well worth the journey. And I know you do too. That's a beautiful legacy. 